Um, so first of all, I'd just like to say welcome. Welcome to everyone uh, to this fourth talk in our spring series. Uh, and a very special welcome to uh, Christine, who is a very old, uh, an old friend of mine. And um, I'll introduce you properly in a mo, uh, if that's OK, Christine. Um, I just wanted to say a little bit, a particular welcome to people who are not familiar with the lay community. Um, you're, you're especially welcome. The lay community is a, a, a group of a community of people dotted around um, the country who are committed to exploring uh, what it means to try and live out a Benedictine spirituality uh, in our daily lives. Um, there's regular prayer for those who are able to join. That's that's uh, five times a day with, with the um, via Zoom, but that commitment to pray, to um, and to serve in ways that reflect a Benedictine spirituality. So uh, we may say a little more before the end on that, just so that that context is there. I just want to start with a, a prayer. So I'm just going to say in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. I just want to give thanks for this opportunity for us all to gather, to listen, to reflect, to share with each other. I pray for a gift of openness for all of us and that ability to hear with the ears of the heart. I give a special thanks for Christine, for all that she brings to the world through her work, through her life, and who she is. I pray that our time together this evening will be of service to your kingdom. Through Christ, our Lord. Amen. Great. So in a moment, I'll, I'll introduce Christine, uh, who hopefully will then share some um, thoughts that she's brought along and she may share a slide occasionally as we go along. So don't be uh, surprised if a, a slide pops up as we go. Um, but she's here to, to, to share some, some thoughts with us. But also then there'll be a Q&A, there'll be an opportunity for people to um, kind of raise their hands virtually and then maybe put their, present their question or their observation, a comment, an idea of their own. Uh, and that's the kind of opportunity for us all to share, really. And then we'll we'll wrap up um, on the hour. So, Christine, I was going to say, um, it's a very special welcome. Christine is uh, the chief exec at CAFOD, and that's where Christine and I worked together. CAFOD is the Catholic Agency for Overseas Development, uh, which is the the official development agency of the Catholic uh, Church in England and Wales. Programs in over 30 countries around the world, development programs, advocacy work and emergencies. And there's been a lot of those recently. I know the teams have been hugely busy. Uh, it's always busy. And before that, Christine was at Christian Aid, uh, head of um, advocacy and campaigns, if I remember rightly. Um, and before that was chief exec at Progressio, uh, which had been the Catholic Institute for International Relations, and uh, you oversaw its transition then into Progressio. Uh, so you got lots of, Christine has lots of experience of working with faith-based faith -based organisations. Uh, we've known each other for about 12 years or so, I think, uh, since those the, 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 the days in Progressio, uh, when Cavod and Progressio were collaborating. Um, I've always been impressed at your the depth of your commitment to anything that you do, um, to your immense professionalism, the wisdom that you bring to your work, and a sense of humour, always a, a kind of warm sense of humour, very approachable. You're someone who I always think lives out their faith on a day-to-day -day basis, the practical ways, a very real kind of living faith. And that was really why we were hoping that you'd come along and talk to us today about what it means to live out our faith in uh, the modern world, really. Um, and so I'm just going to invite you to share the thought that you've brought along with us, uh, along for us. Thanks, Christine. Thanks very much, Jeff, and thanks everybody for, for having me. After that, um, 
after that introduction, I, I feel mildly terrified. Anyway, but I'm going to do my best to, to reflect on my own experience, insights and, and reflections. And um, yeah, because we're all trying to, to deepen our faith and to live out uh, our, our faith through, through prayer and action. Uh, that as a response, really, to God's invitation to, to live, to follow Christ in, in, in challenging circumstances. So I want to start by perhaps just reflecting on a couple of my, my challenges. Um, as Jeff alluded, um, you know, being director of CAFOD means that I, I think um, I have to deal with, well, one of my challenges is the sheer scale and diversity of the things that I have to deal with. You know, just stuff comes to me. Um, that are, that are mildly crazy. You know, uh, being responsible for an organisation, the size and scale of CAFOD, you know, we'll, we're sort of about 50 million, but this year it's going to top 60 because of the income for the Ukraine appeal. Um, and it is a bit daunting. There's still a part of me that's a kind of 12 year old, you know, kid from Liverpool who doesn't know what's going on. Um, one of the big challenges for CAFOD is that the fact that our model is that we work through partners, we work with and alongside partners, we're not directly operational. And, and that means, you know, we have to let go and we have to um, enable people, which is, which is not a challenge. The challenge is our culture as organisations and as a society is about risk, it's about compliance, it's all of those things that actually make letting go and empowering partners extremely difficult and very challenging you know where a, a charity that's accountable to the charity commission you know most of you don't need me to say any more you know um another challenge is that there's always so much going on and taking time out to stop and reflect um can be can be difficult um you know we run from when we don't run from Zoom meeting to Zoom meeting, I tend, I used to sort of like run around the office quite a lot, but I basically just flick screens now, but I also do like running around the office. Um, it can be challenging to respond to the nature of the work that CAFO deals with. You know, we, we are dealing with very, very harrowing and harsh realities in the, in our world you know people and communities in Kenya for instance that I met uh, just last May and June um, who are on the brink of famine uh, are still living with doubt with with drought and you know and I, I often think you know as it's going to be in a couple of months time a year later for that community rains still haven't come a year ago we were walking amidst carcasses of camels and people had nothing you know what what are we what are we are we what are we doing and then other parts of the world where people are defending human rights and they're being disappeared uh, people who are just you know the kind of realities that CAFO deals with on a day-to-day -day basis and I guess one of the challenges there is to is to not become immune to it to still be a human being in the face of it and it's not you, know, you can't you have to develop a level of a thick skin but you can't lose your humanity in that process and of course we can't we can't help everybody we have to say no a lot of the time um whether it's because it's not strategic or it's we don't have the funds or it's just it's too challenging sometimes um so i think it's 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 a very that's a, a big challenge for us of kind of you know that there are the the moments when i don't sleep at night are those moments where i think should should we are we doing enough you know, why, why, why can't we do something on that? Or I'm worried that, you know, some, something, the, a charity commission or a regulator is going to come down on me. And the, the other side of it is about being responsible for a staff team. You know, as Jeff knows only too well, they're quite a demanding bunch. People who, people who work out of passion uh, can often, you know, give you a really hard time. Um, you know, I think we're a very responsive and a flexible employer, but sometimes it feels like, you know, we never do enough um, and we don't always have the resources. So all of those things. So, you know, welcome. That's my world. So I want to introduce. Uh, hello, that's my world. But actually, at the same time. That's one side of the coin. All of those challenges are also real opportunities and moments of inspiration for me. And they're things that make me incredibly humble humbled to be to be the director of CAFOD you know having the the diversity of the workload that I've got is is amazing you know no day is the same 
and the opportunities that I have, whether it be to meet communities in places like Marsabit in northern Kenya, or you know, <laughs> be bouncing around at Flame last Saturday. Wow, you know, with with the with the Cafod youth and the Cafod volunteers who were just incredible with their with their Instagram. Um, frame or their letters and you know just these young people and I'm like yes you know it's so fantastic um, and then Sunday I was speaking at masses in Southwark Cathedral and actually just people saying oh it's so great to hear about what Cafford's doing how fantastic or meeting with a, the director general at, at FCDO as I was last week you know the, the sort of different things that all of us have got to do it, it I get a lot of energy out of um, the the kind of engagement particularly with supporters and particularly with people and communities who who do so much and I guess uh, you know kind of influencing politicians as part of my background too so you know CAFOD is a great team to work with so I, that's really energizing and I think part of that is I know that I'm not working on my own I have a great team um, you know Jeff was part of that team um, so yeah, the responsibility is on my shoulders and I bear that, but I'm not on my own and remembering that I'm not on my own, remembering that it's not all down to me is, is a really important aspect. Um, and, you know, I talked before about hearing the challenges of the realities that are often quite harrowing of the people that we work with and seek to support. Um, that, that is very challenging. And, and also because the scale of their problems very often um, it's just it's beyond us, you know, uh, famine, climate change, oppressive governments or conflict, you know, where we're dropping the ocean and we feel that drop in the ocean. But so many times partners say, thank you for your support. You know, you're standing alongside us. Tell our stories. You've made a difference in our lives. And people talk about the, the, the partnership with CAFOD in such with, with such richness and with such depth that that is constantly a moment of of inspiration for me and reminding ourselves that it's those local partners those local experts who are the real heroes everyone goes oh isn't it wonderful you work for Cafford actually I have you know I, I'm 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 not the person that's supporting the communities they are the real heroes and you know I'm just thinking going back to master bit um Isako who's the the director of Caritas master bit you know he could quite easily work for the UN and you could have you know you could have gold-plated taps and a driver and he could he could have a really comfortable life but he has chosen to work with Caritas Master but his local support in his local community and the, the local church and that for me is, is is a real message for all of us so I'm often very humbled by partners like Asako by the volunteers people like you who give up your time um, you know, who, who, who do so much, so much for CAFOD, by staff colleagues who, who go the extra mile. There's an amazing woman, Julie, in our supporter care team, and she, she, she really ought to be a therapist, you know, because I hear her sometimes, I love to sort of just slightly kind of like sneak by her desk to listen to her on, when she's taking calls, because the, the care and the, and the compassion, and she often says, well, people will sometimes phone up because they've got a query, but actually they just want to chat. And she kind of hears that and she recognizes that and she, she kind of responds to it. And I think that is so special. You know, how many times have you been on the phone to, to, to some blinking customer care person and you think, just treat me like a human being. And there's Julie just loving everybody. I just think it's so, so humbling. And, and, you know, so it's an ongoing challenge. I was just thinking, even while I was writing this talk, there was uh, the, um, that the alerts were coming up on my on my screen about sit reps and you know horn of africa east africa syria earthquake sit rep you know all this all that sort of stuff comes through so it's constant at us so um so how do we then deepen deepen prayer and reflection and i'm 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 i need a bit of a model me because i feel very embarrassed talking about myself and i was doing um having to do recently my um security refresh training and one of the one of the modules was self-care and and, it, and, it, and I saw this model and it really and it made me laugh so it's it, and it's quite a common thing and it's um and it, I only offer it as a model and you've got your own obviously as Benedictines so um but I thought it 
provides me with a bit of a structure to talk through some of the things. This is a secular model, but I think it's um, a useful insight and an opportunity uh, and perhaps something for you to take away and to think about. So this is where I'm going to try and share my screen and find the model. And uh, I'm not going to do that. So can, can you see that? Yeah, that's good. Is that okay? Excellent. So that, so this is the model. Five steps to well-being, it was saying, you know, like, you know what these secular things are all like. So these are the things, these five steps. That I thought, oh, this is interesting. But it was the way they were talking about it um, in, on the uh, self-care module was terribly secular, terribly secular. But then I thought, well, actually, all of these are in, inherent in our faith. So that's what I want to do. I want to take each of these five aspects and just view them through the faith lens and my faith lens if that's if that's okay so i'm going to start with connect i'm going to talk about be active and say take notice keep learning and give so i'm going to lose the screen now if that's all right unless you want to carry on looking at the five circles because i know how much jeff loves looking at circles um but anyway so we'll, we'll leave it at that so i'm going to stop sharing because um, if that's all right with you, because it's just it was just a model so that you saw what I was doing. So connecting. I mean, fundamentally, our faith is about connections, isn't it? It's about a relationship, a relationship with God, with Jesus in particular. And like any relationship, if you don't take time to connect, to value, to appreciate, to talk, to listen, then, of course, it starts to erode. So for me, connecting, particularly with Jesus, is really key. Um, prayer is obviously the most obvious thing. I, I have to admit, I'm not very good at it. I use things like pray as you go, um, particularly during, during Lent. But the one thing that I do, and I don't know whether it's counted as prayer, but the one thing that I do to help me connect um, is that I come, as you can tell by prayer as you go, I come from a bit of an Ignatian background. So I do the examen. And it's just, and, we, and I've got it down to quite a knack now because I've been doing it for so long. It's literally just like five minutes still in bed before we go to sleep. I could probably, I should probably do it, it more. Don't tell the Jesuits, I should probably do it better. But so the five steps, just taking that time to become aware of God's presence, to, um, to connect with God. Um, you, d you don't need this, but I will, I will. Put I've lost me share screen thingy. Where's me share? Oh, there it is. Yeah. Sorry. So I'm going to do, do that. And then hopefully it will, right? So these are the five steps. Um, so become aware of God's presence. Just that connection, just like, usually I do it just by breathing and just taking that time and just, hello, you know, that bit. Review the day with gratitude. Now, we all probably do a little bit of a reviewing the day, but the difference between the, the sort of regular review in the day and the examine review in the day is that word gratitude. It's like, what is it in today that I want to say thank you to God? So, so my connection is about a thank you, is about, yeah, I have a the, there may be things that I've done wrong. There may be things that I've, I've hated, but how can, I, how can I have a gratitude for that? Then the third stage is just to be to connect with myself, pay attention to my emotions. How am I feeling? You know, and it'll be a mixture of, of trying, to be grati trying to have gratitude and, and trying not to beat myself up. And then the idea is, well, what's, what's that one feature? The, the emotions will take me into that place where I've got one feature and I'm just like, oh, help, you know, or okay, thank you, but, and, and pray with it. And just that kind of conversation with God, well, how, what about that? What, ooh, yeah, yeah. Right. And then a kind of looking forward to tomorrow, not to dwell on stuff, a kind of, I'm giving this to you, mate. That's the prayer. I'm giving this to you. Help me. To, to move forward tomorrow and 
that's that's my but usually by that stage I'm well asleep but I mean no no seriously but it is a really important kind of thing for me just to to do that so and that process helps me to connect helps me to connect both with myself and and with God and some of my feelings and stuff as well so and I'm sure that in the Benedictine tradition, you've got your own model of, of doing something probably very similar. So I'm going back to the, to the five, um, to our five little circles. And the second circle was to be active. I mean, and everyone tells us, don't they, all those well-being gurus, be active. You know, we all walk in our, our, our 10,000 steps and all that kind of stuff. Now, and you might think, well, how on earth can one be active in a faith? And I think, I, I think faith is part of my life it's part of who I am so it isn't something that I only do on my knees and of course walking is is part of our faith we've got pilgrimages you know Jeff was talking about um the Scottish cross and all that kind of stuff something wonderful about the rhythm of walking but also about being outside seeing God in all things the breathing the taking the steps there's something wonderful about turning that active into an expression of faith and I know in the early church there's a lot about you know and obviously in in religious communities there's things like um you know build, building digging doing things active you know Jeff and his allotment all those things but whatever it is whatever we're doing in terms of being active it's about putting our faith into practice so I think our activity is also a prayer very often there's that dichotomy isn't there between being active and being prayerful or contemplative as if kind of like maybe not that one's good or one's bad but actually I think it's the reality of both and I think I mean as with you I meet lots of people through working with CAFOD who give so much time and energy as an expression of their faith and I guess are we always aware of that do we always give it credence so I'm doing the big Lent walk for CAFOD, which is, you know, a bit of a challenge, finding the time to walk, but I'm, I'm loving it. It's really nice. And seeing the stories from other people who are doing that walk, um, you know, maybe you might want to listen to music or listen to prayer and reflection as we're doing it, but that's really nice. So my third little circle in my, in the, um, on the list was take notice. So I think this was about, I think the, the, the secular terminology is mindfulness, isn't it? Um, but I like that third plank of well-being is of, of taking notice. And I think it's about remembering the simple things. It's about putting things in, in, um, in, in perspective. Stop and take notice of the world, the trees. I stopped the other day when I was walking because I, I was doing that kind of, oh, I'm going to be late, I'm going to be late. And then I, just, and I saw this tree with blossoms. And it was really, it was really cold and the tree was incredibly bare, but these pink and delicate blossoms were on the tree. And I just stopped and I just thought, God, good grief, you know, and it was just something really powerful about stopping and seeing. And I'm sure that's quite common, actually. In the, I mean, I'm thinking about Tom Cullen uh, as a Benedictine inspiration, you know, very much conscious of what is the earth? What is, what is God telling us through those simple things of the earth? And um, so, yeah, stop take a breath, take notice. Thank God for the wonderful creation that we have, whether it's plants or trees, another person. Taking notice is also what, what Cafford would call a culture of encounter, stopping and engaging with people, taking notice of that person. Ah, oh, you know, I love that frock or how are you? And listening seriously to the answer rather than, okay, I've, I've done the how are you now. So taking notice of people is recognizing God in other people. And I think that's, that's why the examine is helpful for me because it helps me take notice of, of, of the day and, and reminding me of when I didn't take notice of people well enough. And sometimes I find that God reminds me to notice something that I know I hadn't in that day. So the fourth circle, keep learning oh, very interesting isn't it so that well-being stage is keeping learning and i think this um this is about obviously surprising ourselves you know keeping the brain active 
doing something new and different you know some people pick up projects you know they learn to play the piano or learn a new skill or something and for me that 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 keeping learning is is part of is part of my faith prayer I have to say is a constant learning exercise I don't think I know, never get it right sometimes it's a conversation sometimes it's stillness I don't know but it's it's that kind of learning but I'm also trying to do some some actual learning. I try to, tr to try and have at least occasionally, you know, books on the go of of things. You know, Anna Rowland's book on them, um, you know, the Catholic social teaching. I'm reading at the moment Tony Annett's book on Catholicomics, which is which is quite fascinating about how social teaching applies to the economy. Um, and it's stuff that you know I kind of have known for years, but it's really good to hear and read and and have that have the learning deepening. I remember quite a long time ago, I really got into finding out about the historical Jesus. There was a book, Hugo um, Echegaray, on the practice of Jesus. And it was fascinating stuff about the realities of first century Palestine, about a community occupied by the Romans, about the, the nature of the different groups that we hear about in scripture, you know, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Samaritans. And for me, it put a whole different perspective on not just my understanding of scripture, but my relationship with Jesus, I kind of, I got this sort of sense of, of a real, quite a kind of personal uh, relationship because I kind of felt, oh, here's, here's, you know, there were certain bits that I kind of, that really resonated with me. And, you know, when we talk about things like liberation theology and reading the Bible from the perspective of the poor or reading the Bible from different perspectives, for me, understanding that historical, the historical Jesus and the kind of, the challenges, yes, it, yes, he was divine, but yes, he was human. And he went through so much stuff that we went through. So when we talk about Jesus, you sacrificed, you gave your life for me, it can all sound all wonderful. And, you know, the guitar riff and all that kind of stuff. Actually, that's right. That's real. He knows some of the kind of stuff that I have to deal with because he's done it. He's been there. He's got the T-shirt and how. So, you know, understanding the society, learning uh, was re is really kind of quite an interesting thing for our faith there um and you know um life prayer and faith life is always a process of learning but sometimes we we might focus on different bits and again i use uh, the, another um sorry jesuit website is thinking faith i find that a really uh, interesting uh, opportunity it's an online platform um my apologies to the Benedictines for the, for the theme there. But, you know, it's an online journal. It's got loads of articles that gives us always plenty of food for thought. Some, sometimes they're really simple and they're easy. Sometimes they're utterly impenetrable because they're bleeding Jesuits. But there's definitely something for everyone. So the last of our five circles was give. And um, no, this is not a fundraising talk for CAFOD. It's not. Um, and but research shows that people of faith are generally, you know, generous and they feel better by general and people who give feel better about themselves. And I know that it's part of our faith, isn't it? Many of us give our time, our money, our presence, um, especially during our practices of Lent. It's recognized as being, you know, a part of uh, beneficial to one's mental health, whether you volunteer or whether you give cash. But for us, of course, as faith, giving is an essential element of Lent. And it's why we ultimately remember that Jesus gave his life for us and he sacrificed himself for our sins. But we're asked to, to make some simple sacrifices where very few of us are ever asked to give our lives for others. Uh, yet I do see that sacrifice in many of the partners of CAFOD. Um, as I said before, people like Isaka, who could have gone off and had a great life, uh, so many of them return back to communities to support them. And likewise, in, in our staff and volunteers, people who give up, give of themselves and give for the good of others. That's really, really very prescient at the moment. So... They're my five, um, five, five bits, my five circles. I'm going to try and share my screen one more time. Um, uh, what a, uh, share. So, uh, so we had the, um, so we've had the, okay, let's try and do this now. Nope, it's not working, is it? Is it, is it frozen? So, uh, yeah. It's, so I think I've had my five, um, my five 
elements, me five circles, the five steps of the exam, but this one is the final thing and it's only three. I think all of this is summed up in what for me is, you know, my own personal manifesto, the three pronged manifesto from the prophet Micah. The Lord is clear what is, is needed of all of us. And it's just this acting justly, loving mercy and walking humbly with your God. If ever there was a, a clarity, a simple way to deepen our lives, it's this. And it's something that really um, I try to, I fail miserably at, but I try to live out as much as possible. And here, are the, here there's the uh, website things for prayer as you go and thinking faith. They're not they're not that difficult. So I'm going to end there, and then uh, you can you can grill me with questions. So thank you so much. I hope it's been some of some interest to you tonight. Thank you. Thanks, Christine. There's lots in there, lots and lots to for us to mull over and reflect on, but lots of practical things as well. I'm struck by how you described the challenges that you face and the opportunities that come from those. Uh, I was linking those to the challenges that you, you pulled out for Jesus, that that the reality, the reality of Jesus and bringing that kind of bringing that home into right into the modern moment, into 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 our daily lives and the five circles, the examine, the walking or whatever practical kind of activity is there that. Um, Remembering the simple things, whether it's nature or the compliment to somebody, to, to recognise God in the moment. Um, that's a great kind of theme for me in terms of the Celtic spirituality, to really understand God in the moment and know how close, how thin the veil is in, at any given point um, for us. And then that, that there was lots in that area around learning. So we've got the, the links that you've given, but that that sense of the Bible and of the modern, the, the catonomics, you know, to to kind of really unpack those lots in there. Um, thinking faith. Yeah. And then that the feel good factor of giving. Uh, we were I was at a, a talk last night in in the parish and. Um, we're talking about the, the the spiritual and corporal acts of mercy, and you you mentioned mercy there the, the, from Micah, the quote from Micah, um, and it was a beautiful description. It said that mercy is love expressed to someone in need, and the need can be tiny. It could be a moment of of encouragement. It could be a compliment. It could be consolation for somebody's morning. It could be all the things that you've described in your talk. But love expressed to someone in need um, beautiful and that those, those are just some of the bits that, <clears throat> that, that that stand out for me so christine thank you so much that was really i was very touched by the personal nature of your um account of living a christian life and um, i know you've just come back from flame so what is it do you think for young people that will help to encourage them to to really go on that journey of exploration of faith and to to to, to be to be motivated i mean you saw the wonderful motivation of all those people there um and it, it was wonderful i'm sure but what what do you think it is um well, I think I think there's a couple of factors. I mean, uh, I'm kind of feeling like I ought to go into the kitchen and ask the 17 year old what what, yeah, what, what she thinks because I'm the wrong person. But what a couple of things really struck me from Flame. One was um, the energy of the young people. You know, I mean, we know that. Um, and and yet, you know, so there was a there was a whole load of time in the after, you know, for a lot of the afternoon where they were absolutely bouncing up and down, and you know, they were really engaging them in their in their culture, you know. So Governor Beer rapper, um, you know, a, a singer Anika who was uh, amazing, you know, a lot of contemporary music. But there was also, you know, you could hear a pin drop during adoration at the end. I mean, it was re really fascinating. It was not. It was how those things really. You could you could be a kind of you could be in the hello Wembley time and have that kind of silence of adoration. 
But what struck me was that, you know, uh, the young, the energy of the young people really, really related to to people who were talking about their faith and what their faith meant. And it was that there was a little bit of um, at times uh, it, this is going to sound awful, but it didn't feel very Catholic <laughs> in terms of how I was brought up, you know, because you had you had people who were testing testifying almost of kind of like this is what my faith meant to me but they were doing it quite authentically as Catholics but it didn't feel like it was a you know a, a tradition that we're used to um and and seeing seeing younger people on the stage looking like them the we there were there were talks from um you know no offense but older men um but there were also young young people um who were talking about their life as well. And I think being able to see people who look like them, particularly from a black and minority ethnic communities, was really important. And I was really struck at the diversity of, of, of the young people who, who were there, incredibly diverse. It was really, really good to see. So I think I think that sense of, of identification, that sense of, of, of people not being afraid to, to talk about their own testimony and their own lives. Anika, who's one of the singers, she who's incredible incredible voice so she she said i'm going to show you two pictures one picture was her at flame four years ago and then the other picture was her on the voice All right and you know and for people who are like that who are able to say i'm i'm proud to be a christian is so powerful and if, and you know and she was like you know i'm on the voice and i'm praising god for being on the voice and everyone's like yes you know i mean i'm <laughs> fantastic <laughs> you know and governor began put your hands in the air and bishop's going yeah. you know, it was great so i think we've got we've got to find we've got to be able to sort of have that sort of time and energy for to to uh, we've got to have that make that space for them but also to recognize that they're not they're not just there for the feel good factor they were absolutely there to be committed and to to be part of you know adoration mattered so it was a really it was a really fascinating kind of mix for me so um yeah i, I and i think i think I, I don't i think communities like your own are, are a great opportunity in some respects for for, for younger people to join in because they're, they're they don't often feel very welcomed in, in your average church on a Sunday morning. You know, they're kind of, um, mm. you know, it's a bit, my own daughter, well, it's a bit dull in it, you know, <laughs> you know, and it's kind of like, you know, I don't, you know, I'd rather have a conversation with, with you, I, with me about, you know, about Jesus, but I don't want to, I don't necessarily want to be in that kind of like formal sort of space. So it's, it's quite, you know, we all, we all go through those, I went through it, the state, the different stages and finding new engagement. But for me, I come came out of um the, the Cardine methodology of the young Christian workers, young Christian students, where it was very much like to like methodology. So I was with other young people talking about what did my faith mean to me? And that's really that's powerful. And I think that was what we experienced at Flame of kind of like that that space where young people can be together and and feel that they're part of it's not just a herd mentality, but they are part of something. And then that's part of something bigger and seeing people around the world also kind of helps that too that's, but i don't know you. if any of us had any good answers to that the church have been a better place <laughs> anyway. i think that that idea of like to like uh, of being able to hear uh, testimony from people who you identify with is so fundamental absolutely yeah. So well said. Thank you, Christy. It well, it certainly exercises us. For us, it's an important part of our mission mm. is to find yeah. ways of translating our spirit and spirituality into something that is just relevant and attractive. Yeah, it is mm. very important. Great. Cool. A big part of the lay community, the, 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 the teamwork, the children's work, the, the, the whole youth element. Mm. I think I think giving them a role a role as well you know I mean what, oh, yeah. what I think a lot of the time you know you hear people say oh yes well what about the youth it's like well ask them you know what what, yeah. what can you do what will you do and sometimes it'll be like oh I feel a bit nervous but yeah. it's 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 that kind of it is playing that leadership role um, yeah, this yeah. year we're very proud Christine because our Easter organizing team are all in their 20s Good on you. <laughs> well done. Wonderful, Charles. I see you. Your your hand is up as well. Yes, yes, it is. Um, 
I seem to be a bit blurry on my my screen. I don't maybe my lens needs wiping. But anyway, thank you very much, Chrissy. That 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 was a very very uh, good good input for us. Um, turning to perhaps more, more to the day job, I'm I'm just struck how you, you you talked about you know 50 60 million pound budget being a drop in the ocean, and you know where the issues are so challenging and the need is so great. Uh, I'm just wondering how you approach prioritisation and how you decide where to focus CAFOD's resources and what guides you in coming to your decisions there? Oh yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I'll hand over to Jeff. No, I won't hand over to Jeff. Um, well, I think there's, there's, there's two words. The first word is strategy. We've got a strategy. We've been through a process of trying to reflect on, on what, what is important to CAFOD. And we've got, a, you know, we've got four planks of a strategy of four areas. And under those four areas, we've got 10 change statements of things that we really want to kind of see a shift in. And so some of that's about, well, how so, so that strategy informs the decision making around, well, how, how will this help us reach the most vulnerable and the, and the poorest? Uh, how will this really connect um, how will this be done in a sustainable way? Hearing, connecting, hearing the cry of the earth and how the cry of the poor. So we're not, we're not, we're helping to build and regenerate the earth, not just um, damage it. Uh, how will this help local leadership and the local, the voice and agency of local people? Uh, so we'll do things differently. Those, those are the kind of key questions in our strategy that are very practical. And then the second word is subsidiarity. So very rare for me to make a decision about where we spend any money um and and rightly so who am i to tell to tell our uh, head of head of program in kenya where she should where, where where the priorities are it's not for me i don't know you know i have to trust her guided by the strategy responsible taking responsibility but the person, you know, the, I'm working with the partners and local organizations who, who have that analysis, who have that knowledge, that decision has to be taken at the right level. So the subsidiarity issue is really key. And obviously I have oversight. I have, you know, I, there's, there's stuff where I take responsibility. Um, you know, there's a, big, there's a big issue of the pie, the size of the pie, the shape of the pie, what we, what we focus in on. But at the end of the day, some of those questions about, well, um, do we do we is it is it food here and water there or you know supporting communities there or communities somewhere else those decisions have to be and they're really tough decisions but they have to be taken by people who understand the context and who have done that work and done that analysis and that's that that's we've got to we've got to be proud of that and trust that yeah. and we might not always get it right but yeah and it's also pretty difficult as well that are not met must be very difficult as well when you've got you know your, your your plans are proceeding for the year and then as Harold Macmillan said events did boy events did you know you you, you get you know, something like the earthquake or or something that, that comes out of left field and and provides extra demands that, that yeah. sort of mess up perhaps what what you had been planning to be doing well we do with the ironically uh CAFO's really good at emergencies and um you know we've got money we, we do set aside part of our budget to be able to deal with emergencies because because stuff happens um and you know we're constantly we're, we're, con we're constantly sort of asked around around that and um sorry i shouldn't go into too much detail because i'm conscious of time and how many people have got their hands up but I, you know I, it's the the issue the challenge for us is that ongoing work so you know i was talking before about master in northern kenya you know 30 odd million people across across northern kenya Somalia, Ethiopia, South Sudan, and we're looking at the fifth failed rain. We're looking at the worst drought in 40 years. Where is it? It's not on our screens. And it drives me mad, absolutely mad. And for the last 18 months, we have been bashing away uh, at the situation. And, you know, I can't get a disasters emergency appeal. We can't get coverage on the telly. And it, it, so for me, the frustration is that kind of ongoing, slow onset emergency that is hidden, totally hidden until, until we'll end up back in a 1984, 1985 situation where some, you know, poet, it'll be, it'll be Fergal Keane will, will go and it, and it will be the, 
it'll be the live aid kind of thing again but we've been banging on about it for two years and we haven't got anywhere and yeah. and so it's that it's that that's the hard bit Charles sorry I've gone off on one there but you know that that right. is the hard bit of keeping keeping f- true to to the ongoing work in the face of all the the extra demands and the and the and, and the events <laughs> you're absolutely right yeah I'm thinking that's that a- thanks Charles there I was just thinking that what you'd said earlier must be critical at a time like this, that, that sense of the cycle or in just the examine or the, you know, the, the, the well-being piece. It's critical to stay and to know that, that through prayer, we're not alone. Mm. I think, Chris, um, I, I I was gonna say, Chris, can I just say, I'm going to take three in a row. So uh, if you can make your point and maybe we could hear Liz and then Peter and Catherine, and then let's see what we can uh, what what Christine might take to reflect from those. So. Thank you very much, Christine, for being so open with us. And having a model is very helpful for us to remember, you know, the key points and things. So uh, there were two questions, so you don't need to do both. But uh, how do you cope with things when things go wrong? How do you cope in, you, in your own faith when things go wrong? And uh, the other one, how does the church feed your faith or does it? <laughs> go on come on i've written them down i've written those two <laughs> okay liz could you can we hear from you okay so you may not like my question so i used to work for a small charity which went into liquidation at the end of december and um, what i mean i'm not talking about it from my point of view but from the point of view of the people that that are not no longer going to get the help how it was a really small local charity how how do you answer the question about all these big charities that are doing great work are squeezing out the small ones and are not going to be able to survive and then the other question I've got (laughs) um it was when you were talking about the examine um because I I also am very keen on Ignatian spirituality as well as being a Benedictine and you mentioned the gratitude but you didn't mention the, the the other bit about what 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 things haven't gone so well in your day <laughs> I know you were probably trying to focus on the positive so I get that yep great thanks Liz and then was it Peter or Catherine it's it's Peter oh, um right. hi Christina wonderful talk thank you very much um, I wanted to ask you something about Cafot's approach. You said at the start that the approach is to work through partners who are the experts in, in what is happening in their place. And I, I'd just like to hear something about what your approach is, what Cafot's approach is to making the voices of those partners heard in, in the first world. Yep. Great. Cool. Over to you, Christine. Great. Okay. Right. Um, well, I think the cope. How do I cope when things go wrong and the thing and reflecting on the things that don't go so well? Um, thanks, Liz. You're absolutely right. I mean, my some someone once said to me. I think it was in one of my appraisals that my um, irrepressible optimism is at times annoying. <laughs> so, so I know that I know I'm a glass half full person because. I, and I've worked at that because I'm really hard on myself. I'm, I'm, I, th- the first thing I will pick up on is what I've done wrong, what I could have done better, what I haven't done. So it, it, it is really challenging for me because I beat myself up something terrible when, um, when things don't go well or I haven't done things as well as I think I could have done. Um, and and I think you know coping when things go wrong. There's 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 obviously there's the practical kind of issues around you know following due process and all that kind of stuff. Have you know are the things that we have to correct? Of you know is it a is it a safeguarding you know issue? All of the, the very practical things. But on a personal level, you know there is there, it, it does have to just come down to working it through and and taking time to reflect and think well. Could I have done that better? What can I learn from it? What can, do I have to undo something? Do I have to apologize? Do I have to, you know, really address something? Or do I just have to actually do it better next time, really be conscious of, of what I've learned from? And I think, I think there is, um, 
I don't, I don't know, Jeff can tell whether I've done it or not, but as leadership in an organization and being able to be vulnerable and being able to say, I made a mistake. I'm sorry. I've made a mistake. I didn't do that right. Yeah. is a really important thing. And it's not something that we're taught well in terms of leadership. You know, you don't have to look at the church. You know, our ability to say sorry is, you know, even though we have a penitential right every blinking time we have a mass, as an institution, it, it feels incapable of saying sorry. Uh, you know, so I think there's a whole load of stuff that we that we have to do. And I think the 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 nature of recognizing our, our smallness and, and humility as human beings um of course things will never go will never go all right all the time and we kind of have to just accept that's that's what we've got to that's what we've got to live with and but know that ultimately well, we're still loved we're still we're still we're still god's creatures we're still trying to do our best uh, so um so that uh, liz you raise a really important question about um big charities squeezing out small charities and I don't think there's an easy answer to that one CAFOD in terms of its in terms of its model overseas obviously is trying to support as much as possible local organizations and smaller organizations um, and I know that you know we've been working a lot with Caritas and the CSAN Caritas member agencies and trying to support and encourage you know churches to be engaged with with agencies and you know uh, but you know if it's I kind of can't be held responsible for you know kind of Gafford's um, multi multinational fundraising roller coaster steamroller that's the word steamroller so sorry um um and making making the voice of partners heard uh, yeah absolutely so critical I want to tell you a story very briefly about COP 27 that took place in Sharm El Sheikh uh, last November. I was so proud. I mean, I wish I had the photo, but I, I'd, I'd waste time finding it. There's a photo of our of the CAFOD delegation, okay? Two, two European men. Those European men were there. Um, sorry, nine people, two European men, seven women from the South. Those two European men were there to support the women from the South. They were they were the CAFOD partners. It was they were the delegates. They were the people who were going off to all sorts of meetings and supporting. Dario and Kieran were there to help them with policy bits, with social media, with with helping them on negotiation skills. But the but the real the partners were the people that had the voice. They were our delegates. And I remember meeting a chief exec who said um, to me, "Oh, you you are you going to COP, Christine? You know the way they do. Are you going to COP, Christine?" I'm like, "No." And he's like. Well, why? And I said, well, Tim, what 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 would you be doing? Not not the Tim that's on this, a different Tim altogether. I said, what what well, what are you going to be doing in COP, Tim? And he goes, oh well, oh, well, I've got a few uh, a few meetings, but and it turns out he didn't even have a pass for the for the flipping green zone. You know, it was like it was kind of like for me, it was it, it was like why why would why would I travel halfway around the world when this is the Africa COP and we we have like you know. It's seven partners whose voices are there, and they were in such demand. Those, those, particularly those women who were, and it was their voice that was heard. And then the other one was, uh, we had another colleague, Neil, who's our director of advocacy, who was there as part of the Vatican delegation. So for the first time, the Vatican, having signed the Paris Agreement, were there as a party, not just as an observer. And he was there, liaising strongly with our partners, making and and. He, he wrote a lot of the speeches that Paralyn, Cardinal Parolin gave and to give him his due, he, he read them, he said them. And it, they were voices from our partners straight into the Vatican, spoken out by Cardinal Parolin. I could not be more proud. Hope nice. that answers your question, Peter. <laughs> Sorry, good, Jeff, I'm getting story. excited. It tells, it tells a thousand words. I saw Tony leaning in, but it might be Mary that, that wants to speak. No, it, it is me. Uh, uh, she's, she's done a lot too much speaking the last couple of days. Uh, thank you very much, Christine, for being so open, and that's uh, very helpful. Um, but just a very uh, quick point. You mentioned that Thomas Cullinan, and it's very difficult to find out anything about him. Did you ever meet him, or can you just tell us very briefly whether there's anything that has inspired you or what you've heard that we, we would, would help us in our sort of live simply um, journey? Oh, well, I, I'm, I'm 
Tom was like my next door neighbor sort of thing. So I was from, I'm from, I lived uh, from Liverpool and uh, well, not next door neighbor, but up. Um, my school was like part of in Crosby and was part of kind of like helping him. And so the, I remember sixth form retreat days where we ended up like, you know, building parts of the parts of the house and stuff. Tom, there's some stuff on, I know Martin Bennett was trying to do some work with as part of the Mersey Profits um, project to try and put some of the stuff that Tom, um, Kevin, Kelly and Austin Smith, you know, the three, um, he was, so if, if you just do a, 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 an internet search on Mersey Profits, um, I'm sure you'll find it. And there's definitely, they were trying to put some of the, their writings and their reflections up on a website because I, I spoke at, at the launch of that the other year. Um, and if not, um, I can, I'll try and put, um, Jeff, you can, you can connect us and I'll, I'll try and connect you with Martin Bennett because he's been trying to sort of write up quite a few of the, of the stuff that, that Tom was doing. Um, so yeah, that's the only place that I think, um, they were trying to put it online and stuff like that. But I think if, I think if you just Google Mersey profits, you'll be able to get through. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, Christine. I mean, lots and lots of tips and, uh, and pointers, both to resources and books and all kinds of things this evening. We've, we have run out of time. So I, I just want to say, I'm going to go back to the words I used at the beginning is for me, you're somebody for whom uh, faith is very real and very practical. Uh, and what you see is what you get. And I, I'm just so glad that you gave the time out of a hugely busy, I know how busy you are, that uh, you give the time to, to, to both prepare for this and to spend this time this, this evening with us. So thank you. Um, I'm also going to ask a handover maybe to Adam now, who can wrap things up for us. So thank you very much, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff, for uh, inviting Christine and for organising that. We are very grateful to you, Jeff, for doing that. And uh, Christine, thank you so much for coming. Uh, this has been a wonderful uh, evening for us. So you've given us two models and a beautiful scripture reading to take away and to reflect on. You've enriched us with Ignatian spirituality. And as Benedictines, it's very important that we are not just limited to our own way, but that we open ourselves to different ways. So that was really wonderful. And I feel like, Jeff, you've just been so real. There's a real sense. Of, the, the, the purpose of these talks was to hear people talking about living Christian lives in today's world. And I think that I come away from tonight feeling very humbled. And I feel very honored that you've come and you've shared so openly with us. So I do want to say a big, big thank you on behalf of the lay community, on behalf of all of our guests who are here tonight. Thank you for answering those questions so openly as well. And it's been a real, real gift to us tonight. So thank you. Privileged to be with you. And uh, thank you. Um, um, my love and best wishes to all of you. It's so inspiring okay. to see communities like this.